Good morning, kids. I hope that you all have had a wonderful spring break and that you're ready to jump right back into algebra along with me. So I have my coffee to get going this morning. Maybe you have a glass of water or some hot chocolate or some um, milk and peanut butter toast. So let's go ahead and resume with chapter 10. And we are in section 10.1. We're, we're going to be doing some more work with uh, square roots and radicals. The actual title of section 10.1 is Expressing Square Roots. We're going to go ahead with those and find out that we can use um, fractional exponents when we're talking about our roots and radicals. But for now, did you uh, know that a skeleton wanted to go to the dance and he just wasn't able to go? Anybody know why the skeleton couldn't go to the dance? He had nobody to go with. So I'll go ahead and finish my coffee. And let's go ahead and look at section 10.1. We are in page, on page 396 of Bob Jones University Press Algebra 1. Uh, this is section 10.1. And the first question that they're going to ask us here is, find the square root of 7 to the nearest tenth. Now, you'll remember that we've already worked with finding square roots a lot, but they've been what we call perfect squares. And I said, it's going to help you a whole lot if you memorize your perfect squares 1 through 20. 10 squared is 100, 15 squared is 225, 3 squared is 9, 2 squared is 6, 2 squared is not 6, 2 squared is 4. But what's the square root of 7? What number multiplied by itself is going to give you an answer of 7? Well, there isn't one. So the square root of 7 is an irrational number. It's not a perfect square. And what they're asking you is find the square root of 7 to the nearest tenth. When you get a question like that, they expect you to simply plug this into your calculator. Use the square root key and this answer here says calculator gives 2.645, 2.645, Seven five one three. Now, if you're going to use your calculator, come up with this answer. Is this the answer that they've asked you to give? No, it's not. You have used your calculator, which is okay. But go back to the instructions, and it says, find the square root of 7 to the nearest tenth. So the tenths, you have units, tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So we're going to have to round this to the tenths place, 2.64. So you can say that the square root of 7 is approximately 2.6. And that's all they want you to do when they ask you to actually give a square root or a cube root of a number to the nearest decimal place. You just simply plug that into your calculator. But they're also going to ask you, okay, well, approximately how big is the square root of 7? You don't have a calculator, and for some strange reason, you want to know what square root About how big is the square root of 7? Well, remember when we learned our perfect squares? 2 squared is equal to 4. 3 squared is equal to 9. Okay. So if 2 squared is equal to 4, then it would also be true that the square root of 4 is equal to 2. It would also be true here that the square root of 9 is equal to 3. So the square root of 4 is less than the square root of 7, isn't it? square root of 7 has to be less than the square root of 9. Can you calculate? Can you tell me what the square root of 4 is? Sure you can. Square root of 4 is 2. 
the square root of 9 is 3. So 2 is less than the square root of 7, which is less than 3. So you might not know exactly what the square root of 7 is if you don't have your calculator, but just by your knowledge of, of perfect squares, you know that the square root of 7 is some, somewhere between 2 and 3. And that's all that they want you to do when they ask you a question such as number example number two this says estimate the square root of 129 to the nearest integer this one's real straightforward square root of seven is between two and three it's the fact that we say square root of 129 and more difficult Okay, it says, this one says, estimate to the nearest integer. The difference here is that they're asking you to estimate to an integer. What we did with the square root of 7 initially was it asked you to estimate to the nearest tenth. You have to use calculator that. With the integers, you simply use your knowledge of perfect squares. And you're looking for a perfect square that is less than 129 and a perfect square that's greater than 129. So let's say that we have 129 here. Well, let's think. 10 times 10, okay? 10 times 10 is 100. So that's 10 squared. 15 squared is 225. Or whatever numbers you know real, real, real well. well. Obviously, 100 and 225, the square root of 129 is going to be somewhere in between there. What's the next perfect square? If 10 squared is 100, since we're closer to 129 here than we are to 225, I'm thinking we're going to be real close to it. What's 11 times 11 equal? 121. Aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. 121 is less than 129. So what's the next perfect square after 11? It's 12 squared. 12 squared is 144. So just like 121 is less than 129, which is also less than 144, 11 squared is less than 129, which is less than 12 squared. So 11, which is a square root of 11 squared, is less than 129 the square root of 129, which is less than 12. So the way that that gets written, since it's between the two perfect squares, 11 squared and 12 squared, I'm going to write it this way. 11 squared is less than 129 is less than 12 squared. I'm just writing through these steps to show you different ways that it looks so you understand what I'm doing. 121 is less than 129, which is less than 144. They want you to estimate to the nearest integer right here. So we take the square root of 121, square root of 129, square root of 144. We're not changing the relationship between these numbers here because we're taking the square root of every single one of them. Square root of 121 is 11. Let's see, can you see that? It looks like it. You cannot take the square root of 129 because it's a not a perfect square. 11 is less than the square root of 129. 
the square root of 144 is a perfect square. So this is the answer that they're looking for when you approximate square roots manually without looking for a calculator. Okay? Pretty straightforward, I think. Now, a long time ago, when we began talking about square roots, we did a little bit of vocabulary. We have the cube root of 8 here. This is the cube root of 8. And what you're looking for is you're looking for one single number that when you use it as a factor this many times, or three times, you're going to end up with the number that's underneath the radical symbol. We have some vocabulary that you have to know. The number that sits underneath the radical symbol, remember that's called the radicand radicand, and this little number up here is called the index. We've done that vocabulary in the past. You have to know it or else you won't understand what we're talking about. Now, if you have x, just this variable here, you also know that that's the same as x to the first. Right, because it's understood that if there's no expo exponent showing, it means that x itself is only used as factor one time. You also know that if you have x by itself, what you really are showing is 1x. When you, when you don't see the exponent, you understand that it's just that x used as factor one time. When you don't see this coefficient here, you understand that there's only one x. When you have a radical symbol used by itself, you understand that they're actually asking for the square root of this number. If they, if they say the square root of 4, There's no 2 up here, there, there's no index showing. You know that they mean what number, when you use it as a factor two times, is going to result in number 4. Of course, that answer is 2. So, if you have no exponent showing, you understand it's 1. You have no coefficient showing, you understand it's 1. You have no index written out, you understand that it's 2, which means we're talking about the square root of a number. Just a review of your vocabulary there that's very, very important to know. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 397, there is something that looks strange. You have x, and that's, let me rewrite that for you. is at the very bottom of the page. There sure are a bunch of symbols there. X and this A divided by B and this squiggly thing here. The way that you read this, X to the A over B is equal to the B root of X to the A. Now, I know that that's just so very, very enlightening to you, right? Well, this is just the pattern for when you have an exponent that's raised to a fraction. Let me show you. x to the 1 half. And we just barely, barely touched on these now, but we'll be using them more this week. x to the 1 half. Okay, the denominator right here is the index. So this is 2, your radical sign, x to the a. The a is the numerator, x to the 1, or x. So x to the 1 half, they're really just talking about the square root of x. It's just a different way of writing it. 
So when you have a variable that is raised to a power, let me see what I want to do here. Let me do um, let me just stay with the x. If I have x to the two thirds, how do I translate that into this symbol here where I'm using an actual radical sign? The number in the denominator is the root. The number in the in the numerator is the exponent, which would be two. So, x to the two-thirds is the cube root of x squared. Your denominator is your index, okay? You just have to sort of play around with this, get used to and practice them some. Go ahead and read in your book and look at their examples, see what you can come up with. So let's look at example three on page 398. Okay, first off, what's exponential notation? Okay, exponential notation means you're writing something using exponents. Can you believe it? There's actually a, an example in, in math that makes a little bit of sense what the definition is. So question number three, example number three on page 398 says simplify the cube root of 8 using exponential notation. Okay, well first, can you write 8 using exponents? Well, 8's not a perfect square, but 8 is a perfect cube. Remember that 8, if you factor that into prime factors, would be 2 times 2 times 2, which is also written as 8 cubed, isn't it? Okay, so we can go ahead and think, well, now I have the cube root of 2 cubed. Am I finished? No. The instructions say, write this problem here, write this expression here, the cube root of 8, using exponential notation. So you have to go back and remember that exponential notation, you can have a fraction as an exponent. And the way, you know, this conversion here goes both ways. If you have x to a fraction, you know, written as a rational expression, the denominator is the index and the numerator is the exponent of the factor that, of this number that's written underneath the radical sign, a squared. So, I'm going to have 2, this is the base, sort of right here, radicand. We've got the 2 to the a over b. Well, what is the denominator? The denominator, b, is the root, it's the cube root. A is the index, I did not mean to say index, A is the exponent right here of this number underneath the radical sign. This is, this three is the index, remember, index. And this whole expression underneath the radical sign that's the radicand, but this right here is going to be your exponent. To convert the cube root of 2 cubed into exponential notation, keep this base number here, this 2. You use the index as the denominator. You use the exponent right here as your numerator. So now we have, look at this. We have the cube root of 8 written as 2 to the 3 over 3. Well, that's exponential notation, isn't it? Well, is that all the further that we need it to be? No. Haven't simplified it yet. Always have to simplify your fractions, remember? What is 3 divided by 3? Exactly. 
that's two to the first. Is it necessary to put that two to the first there, or is it even proper? No, that's two to the first is just two. So the cube root of eight is actually two, and the glasses aren't showing me real well. Okay. We've taken the cube root of eight, we've written this as two to the three over three, which is two to the first, which becomes simply two. And that was example number five. Let me do example number six, example um, number four now. See, we have change three to the one half, three to the one third, x to the two thirds to radical form. Three to the one third, x to the two thirds to radical form. Okay. We're not talking about these exponent parts right here, these fractional exponents. Remember, those have to do with the index and with the exponent of the expression, which is underneath the radical sign. So look at this. Our denominator is the same. It has to be the same to be able to convert this expression here. We have 3 cubed, I mean 3 to the 1 third, x to the 2 thirds. Our 3, the exponent is a 1, 3 to the first. Our denominator here is what our index is. So we're taking the cube root of 3 to the first. We have x. We're also taking the cube root of x, but we're taking the cube root of x squared. So this is the cube root of 3x squared. This is how you write this expression here that uses rational exponents, or exponents that look like fractions, write it using the radical symbol. Okay, now let's do the next example where instead of going from fractional exponents to using the radical sign, we're going around and undoing the expression. We have change the fifth root, fifth root of 4x cubed y squared, 4x cubed y squared. Okay, well all you're practicing in this section is, is getting used to the notation, getting used to the um, symbols that you use to express roots. Remember that if you have an expression with a fractional exponent, and if you have an expression that is using this radical symbol here, the index and the exponent have specific meanings when you're using this radical, when you're also using this fractional exponent or rational exponent. <coughs> So we're taking the fifth root of these three separate critters that we have underneath the radical symbol. The denominator of our fraction is b. And where does b belong? Well, b is the index. So we take the index and that becomes the denominator of our fraction. So we have 4 The denominator is a 5. It's the fifth. Well, what's the numerator? The numerator right here is this exponent. So it's 4 to the 1 fifth. Now we have x. The denominator, again, has to be this index, which is a 5. The exponent that goes along with this factor of x becomes the numerator. The x is 3. 
4 to the 1 fifth, x to the 3 fifth. y again has the same denominator of 5. It's that index of a radical. The numerator a is the exponent associated with the y. So writing the fifth root of 4x cubed y squared using exponential notation is 4 to the fifth, x to the three-fifths, y to the two-fifths. And just in and of itself right now, you think, why in the world would you want to do that? Well, it's not helpful in this particular example, but they're just teaching you to convert back and forth between the two forms because there will be a lot, lot of times that it is much easier to work with. Okay, what we are going to finish up with for this chapter now is, set, is example number six. What we've been doing for the last few minutes has been working back and forth with exponential roots and converting them to using the radical symbol notation. We have estimated the integer um, for the two integers between which an irrational root lies. Now they want you to, hmm, doesn't take long for that marker to dry out. Now they want you to estimate the two integers between which the cube root of 50 lies. We've been estimating the square root. Now we're just looking for the cube root. So what you're looking is for is the perfect cubes that are to either side of 50. Remember your perfect cubes. 2 cubed is equal to 8. 3 cubed is equal to 27. 4 cubed is equal to 64. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 3 times 3 times 3 is... 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. 4 times 4 is 16 times 4 is 64. So these numbers get high very, very quickly. 5 cubed is 125. We're only seeing where 50 fits in here in the midst. Well, 50 lies between 27 and 64. So we can say the cube root of 27 is less than the cube root of 50, which is less than the cube root of 64. Perfect cubes, this you have to simplify where you can. The cube root of 27 is 3. 3 is less than the cube root of 50, which is less than the cube root of 64, which is 4. So this is what you're doing when it asks you to find the integers between which the cube, the cube root of 50 lies. And this is how you would write this example, write the answer to this problem. Let me go ahead and do one or two examples from our book, homework section. 10.1 on page 399. Okay, change each radical to exponential form. Let's go ahead and do number five. This is on page 399. Number five says the tenth root of z cubed x y to the fourth. They want you to write this using exponential form which means instead of using this radical symbol, we're going to raise 7 to a power, x to a power, y to a power, and they're going to be, in this case, fractional or rational form. You have to remember that when you have something that uses this form, remember I, I pronounced it in a really strange manner, the bth root of x to the a if you have a radical symbol where you have a root, which is the index, that index is going to be the denominator 
the power to which each factor is raised inside is going to be the numerator. This can be written in rational form or in exponential form as x to the a over b. So you see that the index is the same as your denominator. So what's the denominator of our fractional exponent going to be here? Well, the denominator is going to be 10. So you have 10, 7, with a denominator of 10 is the power that it's raised to. What's the numerator? Well, the numerator is this exponent here, 7 to the 3 tenths, x to the 1 tenth, y to the 4 tenth. Now, what looks strange well, maybe not what, what looks strange, this whole thing might look strange to you, but what's still not correct? 7 to the 3 tenths, x to the 1 tenth, y to the 4 tenths. Yeah, that's exactly right. Your, your simplification rules apply even with fractional exponents. So 4 tenths is not reduced to lowest terms. So this would become 7 to the 3 tenths, x to the 1 tenth, y to the two-fifths because you can reduce four-tenths as a fraction in lowest terms. So this right here is the correct answer to problem number five. Just apply those rules. You know, all of the rules that you've been learning so far about reducing and fractions and multiplying and adding and subtracting dividing all of these things apply for the rest of for the rest of all of your math now this says in number 6 through 10 change each exponential expression to radical form so this would be problem number 10 and this is 3 to the 3 eighths times 5 to the 1 fourth x to the 5 eighths. Okay, now that one definitely looks just a little bit different because we don't have the same denominator here, do we? Well, you have to have common denominators when you're working with fractions. What's common denominator of 8 and 4? Well, it's 8. 3 to the 3 eighths times 5 to the 1 fourth. How do we rewrite that as a fraction with a denominator of 2? To the 2 eighths. x to the 5 eighths. Okay? We have all of that is done very nicely. Now we have this written with the same denominator. It's important to have the denominator because the denominator is the root that you're taking. The root that you're taking is the number that's the index. So we're going to take the eighth root of 3 cubed times 5 squared x to the fifth. Now, do you see what I did here? Once again, you have to understand that if you have a base that is raised to a fractional power, you rewrite that in radical form where the denominator of your fractional power is the index or the root and the numerator goes along with your factor. This tells you how many times this number is being used as a factor of this expression. So this would be x to the a. I'm sure you figured out by now, but this is a very, very, very essential thing to do. You see there's just not any work. It's just con it's remembering to make common denominators when you're dealing with fractions, and then remembering how you convert from 
fractional exponents to radicals, to this radical form here. It is absolutely impossible to get from this step to your answer if you don't have this definition here. Okay, let's see, use a calculator, find the higher roots to the nearest hundredths, use a calculator, and okay, that's the end of section 10.1.